A warm welcome from SGPGI. My heartfelt thanks to Professor Rakesh Kosher, Professor Govind Makaria, Dr. Parimal, and Dr. Bajpay, Amol Bapai to give me an opportunity to present the dilutional hyponatremia and ascites topic in cirrhosis with ACLF. I'll deal the topic under following headings. Hyponatremia is defined as serum sodium less than 135. Its incidence is approximately 57% in hospitalized cirrhotic patients and 40% in outpatient. Its importance is because hyponatremia is linked to hepatic encephalopathy. It impairs the quality of life, basically because of fluid restriction that the person has to undertake. It increases the risk of infection, increases the risk of HRS, increases the morbidity and mortality in patients with decompensated cirrhotics. Actually, it's a very powerful predictor of death in advanced cirrhosis with ascites. It is the hypervolumic hyponatremia. The volume is much high. And why is that? To start with, compensated cirrhotics have an effective arterial blood volume. But with the progression of cirrhosis, there is flanknic arterial vasodilatation that keeps on worsening. Initially, there are compensatory phenomena like degree of activation of renin angiotensin aldosterone system, sympathetic nervous system, ADH, which increase cardiac output, which try to maintain the effective arterial volume. But with progression of decompensation, there is failing of these very compensatory mechanisms, leading to decreased MAP, decreased renal perfusion, decreased GFR. And this leads to worsening of ascites, causing dilutional hypervolumic hyponatremia and type 2 HRS. So in fact, it is not the liver, but circulatory dysfunction leading to persistent decreased effective arterial volume with activation of vasoconstrictors, which culminate in decreased GFR. So this cartoon shows that progression of cirrhosis portal hypertension leads to splanchnic arterial vasodilatation with the activation of endogenous vasoconstrictor system. Prolonged activation with worsening and progression of disease leads to exhaustion with reduced cardiac output and failure of this compensatory mechanism, leading to an effect state of hypovolemia or a persistent reduction in effective vo circulating volume causing severe renal arterial vasoconstriction and reduced GFR. This has its own effect on renin angiotensin aldosterone, AVP, and SNS, causing worsening of ascites, tubular water reabsorption, and inappropriate free water retention, leading to dilutional hyponatremic, and hyponatremia that is hypervolumic. Now look at the renal impact. This is the normal pathophysiology of tubules. What happens in cirrhosis with the ascites, there is progressive reduced GFR. In the descending limb of Henle, there are more and more of water absorption as body sees it as a state of hypovolemia. There is increased ADH secretion and more and more water absorption there, significant water absorption. This causes dilutional hyponatremia and worsens the ascites. And obviously, reduced GFR would lead to renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Many studies have shown that plasma, renin, norepinephrine, and ADH levels keep on increasing as ascites worsens and renal failure sets in. Sorry. So in crux, the pathophysiology of reduced GFR is related to splanchnic arterial vasodilatation, hypoalbuminemia, and systemic vasodilatation. Reduced GFR obviously will have an inadequate action on diuretics and therefore diuretics are many a time stopped here and obviously would lead to worsening of ascites, dilutional hyponatremia and may progress to HRS API. Clinical implications of hyponatremia are varied. It may lead to high prevalence of refractory ascites, higher requirement of LVP, shorter interval during parasynthesis and higher incidence of hepatic encephalopathy, SVP, hepatorenal syndrome. Plus, it has non-specific symptoms, including cognitive impairment, gait disturbances, nausea, anorexia, etc. The issue is the rapidity of fall in sodium is more important than the degree of fall in sodium. And it's, an, again, an independent risk factor for in-hospital mortality and six months mortality. Sodium of less than 130 is strongly and independently linked with development of hepatic encephalopathy, with studies have shown of an hazard ratio of 
So coming to hyponatremia in ACLF, the pathophysiology remains the same. The prevalence is up to the tune of 25%. Now ACLF and hyponatremia, the issues are these patients are sicker. They have a lower 90 day survival. It's an independent risk factor for progression into severe ACLF. Death in hospitalized patients, increased risk of bacterial infections, and once you do parasynthesis of less than five liters, it's less than five liters against LVP in refractory ascites when you do more than five liters. Parasynthesis in ACLF less than five liters. Again, there's an increased incidence of hyponatremia, AKIN in hospital mortality. Probably it's because of worse hemodynamics in these patients. The survival in dilutional hyponatremia is almost comparable to refractory ascites and hepatorenal syndrome. The severity of hyponatremia and the survival uh, is linked with more severe the hyponatremia versus the survival. So the impact of sodium is so much that a meld sodium equation was formed and compared to meld and meld sodium was found to be significantly superior to meld. Therefore, in 2016, meld sodium equation replaced the standard meld calculation for meld more than 11. Now coming to ACLF, hyponatremia and mortality, the Cliff canonic study showed that this subgroup of ACLF with hyponatremia had the worst outcome compared to ACLF without hyponatremia. Management of hyponatremia, we have limited options. Basically, the goal is to reduce total body water by increasing the renal solute free excretion. The methods used were water restriction, albumin, hypokalemia correction, hypertonic saline, and vasopressin receptor antagonist. The sodium correction should be less than 8 milliequivalents per day to avoid osmotic demyelination. You should discontinue beta blockers and alpha blockers if the MAP is less than 82. Coming to water restriction, it is poorly tolerated. Intravenous albumin for hyponatremia, as you give albumin, the sodium keeps on improving. It basically improves the renal blood flow, improves the free water clearance. May also, it might have suppressed the volume mediated ADH by increasing the intravascular volume and oncotic pressure. A recent study on this topic, look at the impact of albumin was done in cirrhotics from Jasmohan Bajaj group. It concluded that hospitalized patient with cirrhosis and hyponatremia who received albumin had a higher rate of hyponatremia resolution that was significant. 69 versus 61%. But the mortality in albumin group was significantly high. On dissecting the patients further, they found that patients who had higher admission GFR and resolution of hyponatremia, that means they had a higher renal blood flow, higher GFR, and who had hyponatremia resolution, they had a better survival. Therefore, again, hyponatremia correction with the higher GFR, that impacted survival. Hypertonic saline is not recommended in, non, in cirrhotics, unlike non cirrhotics where it's very commonly used. It's recommended only to partially correct hyponatremia before liver transplant. So coming to the severe symptomatic hyponatremia group, when sodium is less than 120, the options are you can give albumin until symptoms improve. Hypertonic saline, it's reserved only for symptomatic severe hyponatremia when all other measures have failed and the patient is about to undergo transplant. Hemodialysis, it's an option only in liver transplant candidates with severe kidney function impairment. You use low disolate sodium concentration for dialysis in most patients. You have to avoid democlocycline in cirrhotics as because of nephrotoxicity and high circulating drug levels lead to diminished hepatic drug metabolism. Tolvaptan created a lot of enthusiasm as it was shown to improve urine sodium levels, but hyponatremia recurred when tolvaptan treated patient were discontinued with the drug. Multiple studies were done and RCTs were done on this and to analyze the safety and efficacy of Vaptans. So the safety and efficacy of Vaptans were proved in eight double blind RCTs with more than 2,200 patients. There was no impact on, of Vaptans on mortality, but what was his efficacy? So a meta-analysis of RCT showed that Vaptans Increased serum sodium levels by more than 2 millimoles. It changed the body weight by approximately 2 kgs. It also improved the time to first LVP and the clinical severity of ascites. But large volume parasynthesis 
numbers were not different in the intervention and control group. So partial improvement in serum sodium and weight did happen. Could, can we give Vaptens with diuretics? Here again, Vaptens act on collecting tubule and do not impact the renal blood flow or the GFR. So Vaptens with diuretics fared worse compared to Vaptens alone. Coming to survival analysis, the biggest question. Here, Vaptens disappointed. Short and long-term survival did not change. No data has shown that increasing serum sodium concentration alone improved morbidity and mortality. So what next? How to improve the survival in these patients? Here is the impact of hemodynamic correction in this subgroup of patients. Patients who were treated with midodrine to keep a map more than 82 millimeters of mercury had a much higher survival over 48 months follow-up compared to patients who had a map of less than equal to 82 millimeter mercury. So this was the impact of hemodynamics that benefited survival. Again, a recent study took 10 patients with hyponatremia. A 48-hour albumin challenge was given. After failure, midodrine and octreotide were given with rapid titration to a dose of 15 milligram TID of midodrine and 200 micrograms TID of octreotide. The study did show improvement in serum sodium level that was significant from 124 to 130. It concluded that significant increase in sodium and urinary electrolyte free clearance could be achieved with this above combination. So once you have this pathophysiology, how to alter the dynamics so that reduced GFR improves, the action of diabetics improves so that we can mobilize the situs, hyponatremia and HRS. Can these things be tackled? by pharmacological methods, well, yes, sturdypressin, albumin, and NORAD are methods that can pharmacologically improve the pathophysiology and hemodynamics and alter the GFR. Once GFR is improved, furosemide can be given so that the improvement in ascites does happen. How to measure? These are markers, are renal artery resistive index less than 0.7, if that can be achieved, that's a surrogate marker for improvement in GFR. And urine sodium more than 80 millimoles, if, it, if achieved, definitely improves the free water clearance. It should help to mobilize free water, improve dilutional hyponatremia and reverse HRS. So for the past nine to 10 years in SGPGI, we have used slow albumin, furosemide and vasoconstrictor combination in a response guided manner. We wanted to achieve urinary sodium more than 80 and reduce the RAR. In this study that was published in ASLD and it's under uh, review in JCI, there was 87% clinical success in mobilization of ascites and refractory ascites with hyponatremia. Serum sodium improved from 124 to 133. Urine sodium improved from 20 to 183. Urine output also increased from 587 to more than 3.7 liters, maximum that we could achieve. The most important issue was improvement in hemodynamics parameter with cardiac output, cardiac index, systemic vascular resistance, SVRI, arterial compliance, stroke volume, CVP, and RARI all improved significantly. So this study showed there was significant improvement in peripheral hemodynamics and cardiac parameters. And the biggest thing was there was significant survival advantage and significant improvement in renal artery resistive index, improving the GFR. We also did the same combination use in patients with acute on chronic liver failure. And here also we had a significant improvement in survival and renal artery resistive index in this subgroup of patients. We had 136 patients of ACLF group and 94 patients who did not achieve slow albumin furosemide combination, but had SMT group. So to conclude, it is a difficult problem to treat pathophysiological assessment and hemodynamic correction may have an important role to play in therapy. Response-guided parameters to improve GFR and urinary sodium may help. Liver transplant, obviously, is the final say. So it is not an interplay of liver alone. It's a combination of liver, hemodynamics, gut permeability, bacterial translocation, and reduced renal perfusion that impacts hyponatremia. Thank you. I welcome any questions.